to host their reading. Reading from Matthew 13, 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore, then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times was what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word at once, receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorn refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of, his, of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. The word of God for the people of God. microphone works. I think I turned it on, Candace. Is it on? We'll be up here. Because I know nothing made my grandma's day like when little kids were in church. You know why? Because kids say the darndest things, and she was always guaranteed a chuckle. I missed your name. What's your name? Elliot. 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 I'm Christine. It's nice to meet you. So, have you ever been hungry? As hungry as I am right now? Have you been hungry? And we know that sometimes when we get hungry, we can get irritable meaning we get cranky. Do mom and dad ever get crabby when they're hungry? We have a word for that. Hangry. You're correct. How many of you have ever been hangry? I'm trying not to be right now. So next show of hands, who here has been camping? Now back in the day I had a camper and we called that glamping. It had an outdoor kitchen. It was 35 foot long, flat screen TV, Blu-ray disc player, you know, full walk-in shower, really roughing it. So when you camp, if you don't have an outdoor kitchen, sometimes you'll cook over an open flame. Sometimes you can even use sticks you pull off the tree and you can roast marshmallows. Have you ever done that and made s'mores? They're the best. Have you ever made s'mores with the Reese's peanut butter cup? That's good too. Sometimes we can even put hot dogs on the end of the stick and put it over the flames and that's a good hot dog. So cooking while you're camping is essential so that you don't become hangry. In fact, you might even consider it a blessing that we even have food to cook over our campfire, food that we can share with others camping with us. These are blessings provided to us by God, and we don't have to give up anything to 
receive those blessings. Is that pretty cool? Pretty cool. So after the meal, while the campfire begins to die down for the night, our focus can kind of shift. I don't know about you, but the fire relaxes me. I could just watch a bonfire forever. But as the bonfire starts to burn down for the night, my eyes kind of look up to the sky. Anybody else get mesmerized by all the stars up in the sky? Do you like looking at the stars in the sky? You ever take time to do that? So when we stare at the stars in the sky, we're reminded of how big our God is. If you had to show me with your arms, how big is God? This or this? I think we have a pretty big God. So speaking of stars, Elliot, let's look around. Let's pretend we're looking at the stars in the sky. Dad, you can go sit down. I won't embarrass you. Enough's enough, right? So friends, let's look around. Let's look at the, sky, the stars in the sky. And there are so many of them. God knows each of those stars by name. And what's amazing is God knows each of us by name. That's just one example about how much God cares for us. So how many of you pray at bedtime? Um, I religiously pray at bedtime. I still say the prayer my grandma taught me. Now I lay me down to sleep. I still say that every night. So Elliot... Tonight at bedtime, I want you to look out the window and gaze at the stars and remember how awesome God is, that he made them, and that he knows you by name. And so with inspiration from the book of Isaiah, you guys can do this also. Um, in fact, repeat after me. This can be a bedtime prayer. Look up towards the sky. Who created everything you see? The Lord causes the stars to come out at night one by one. God calls out each one of them by name. And I pray for each person in my family in the same way. I see a star in the night sky. And Elliot, this is where you can say, and I pray for mommy and daddy. Sound pretty cool? And we can also insert members of our family or those we love or just any neighbor that we care about. We can do that while we look up to the sky and remember God's good creation and that he knows each of us by name. I think that's pretty cool. Elliot, thanks for joining me. And dad, too. He got a fruit roll-up. I'm trying to think of the last time I've even seen a fruit roll up. If I've not met you before, my name is Christine Lippert and I'm so blessed to be the pastor of this church. It's already been three Sundays and sometimes I feel like it's already, I can't believe it's only been three Sundays, but most of the time is I can't believe it's already been three Sundays. I want to do a few thank yous, and it can be dangerous doing it by name because I will miss someone, I know it, and I ask for your grace if I forget you because you've all been so welcoming. I want to thank John for faithfully leading us in worship each and every Sunday. To him and Pam for leading meetings, helping me in my transition, having dinner with me, taking me on home visits. Candice, you're priceless. Candace will kill wasps for me. When she sees me running out of the church building, she will just happen to be looking out her own front window and come to rescue me. Um, she even answers late night emails when I think no one else in the world is still up. She will respond after 11 p.m. and say, can you give me access to that bulletin you just sent me? And I said, please don't worry about it right now. I wouldn't even think you're up. She's priceless. And she's been rocking out some new graphics on our Facebook page. If you do not follow our Facebook page, do so, because she's been rocking it. Wandine, for being our rock star piano player. My own father didn't compliment my sermon, but said, boy, that woman can play. And I know she doesn't take it as a compliment, but I feel like I am sitting in an old Western saloon. The way you pound on those keys, I just love it. And for everyone who does ministries outside these walls and represents our church, like Sue and Mary at the thrift store, or Sue, you helped me at the care center for worship service this past week, and that was really special. 
In the days ahead, I would love help reaching out to those who have perhaps been disconnected from the church for a bit or maybe longer. If you would like to be part of um, a team of people to make calls or maybe even accompany me on uh, porch visits, please text me or email me. I believe I put both in the bulletin this week. And again, we're not going to be pushy. We're not, we're not going to go inside. We're just, we're just going to visit them and tell them we miss them and we'd love to have them. Remind them we're still here. So as I mentioned, this is my third Sunday with you, and we're continuing in our discipleship series, meaning how can we grow to be disciples or how we, can we grow in our discipleship? We've talked about godly or gospel hospitality within these walls, with one another, and outside these walls, witnessing to the goodness of God and living out what it means to truly love our neighbor. Last week we talked about taking up the yoke of Jesus and how kingdom work might not always be easy, but if we lean into Jesus, he can carry some of that burden with us. And this week, I want to ask you to imagine the potential and fruitfulness in each of us, and then to work for that in the whole ministry of this church. This month of July, we've been making our way through the Gospel of Matthew. Now, some pastors will have multiple Bible readings each Sunday, and I'll get there, because along with the Gospels, I love me some Psalms, and I promise we'll get there, because I want your nose in the Bible as a spiritual discipline as we mature in our faith together. So to reiterate, we're learning how to grow as a disciple or grow in our discipleship, and what better place to look than in the Gospels, the Gospel where Jesus first called the disciples from their boats onto the shore, where he taught them how to fish for people. The Gospels tell us of how he equipped those disciples for ministry, and so what a perfect place for us to learn and be equipped for this faith journey. And one of the ways that Jesus taught the disciples and others who followed him was through the parables. And today we heard, thank you Pam, the parable of the sower. Parables were one of Jesus' favorite teaching tools. A parable is a short story with usually just one main point and no specific names. Parables provoked new ways of thinking about something. There are 35 parables in the Gospels. Some say, and I love this description, some say a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And by teaching in parables, Jesus both illuminated the hearts of the spiritually sensitive and frustrated the minds of the spiritually blind. The same uh, parable could be a blessing or a curse, depending on the mind of the person who is listening. And the same is true today. So I believe we have an advantage to understanding the parable of a sower, given where we are blessed to live. It never escapes me, it hasn't yet in three weeks, that on any morning on my drive in or any afternoon on my drive home, I have the most gorgeous example of God's creation surrounding me. Every morning and every afternoon, I see field after field of grain. I've never been a city girl except for, you know, my glamping. I've never been amazed by a skyscraper, and it has nothing to do with my fear of heights. I'm in awe of fields of grain, the green corn that'll soon dry and change. I love to see the wheat gently swaying in the breeze, and the beans, the greenest of beans, that will soon change also. And if you drove or walked to church, most likely you saw a field, if even from a distance. I hope you never take that for granted. There are people who will never ever see a field up close. There is a child that will never see corn, beans, or wheat until it's packaged or canned. So how blessed are we to see what a sower of seed can do with the right soil? So let's set the scene for today's parable. Jesus gets in the boat for the purpose of relieving that overcrowding. Tons of people were on the beach on the shore. But being out in the, in the water would also be good acoustically for people to hear him. Friends, the boat is his pulpit. And a little background to understand the illustration Jesus uses. He is addressing the Galileans, who are mostly agrarian peasants. Agrarian is a fancy long word for meaning sower of land or farmer. So seed was sometimes sown before the ground was even plowed. 
The ground wasn't turned up and dug into to really see what kind of soil it was even going to be. It might be rocky. It might be filled with thistle. And so this is what Jesus says. What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road and the birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel, it sprouted quickly, but it didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds, and as it came up, it was strangled by those weeds. Some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. And then he asked the people, are you listening? Are you really listening? So we're lucky that the first disciples, like us, weren't too proud to ask what the parable meant. So Jesus goes on to tell them, and us, what the harvest story means. He says, Study the story of the farmer planting seeds. When anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it remains on the surface. And the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's heart. This is the seed that the scat farmer scatters on the road. The seed cast in the gravel. This is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm. But there's no soil of character. And so when the emotion wears off and some difficulty arises, there's nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news. But weeds of worry and illusions about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle what has been heard, and nothing comes of it. The seed cast on good earth is the person who hears and takes in the news and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Friends, as you sit here this morning, how is your soil? Does the seed stand a chance? I will admit there have been days when the seed does not stand a chance in my soil. There are other days when our minds and our hearts are like the soil that is shallow and full of bedrock. There are days when disappointment or disillusionment set in, when our physical or emotional suffering becomes a barrier of bedrock, preventing the good seed from sinking down into the depths of our hearts. Suffering may make us better or bitter, and some days it makes us bitter. There are other days when our souls are full of weeds. These weeds are identified in the interpretation of this parable as the cares of the world and the lure of wealth. We know about those weeds, don't we? The lure of wealth may not even be about the wealth itself, but it may be about the power, the position, and the place that comes with that wealth. And these cares could be anything, not even necessarily bad things but preoccupations and concerns that distract and keep us from doing what is really important by loving others. These cares and aspirations choke out the life of a good seed. For many of us, it doesn't take much to distract us from or turn us away from the wisdom and truth that could make a huge difference in our lives. Keeping the weeds out requires fairly constant attention. Who loves landscaping and gardening? I do when it's not 100 degrees. I have tons of landscaping around my house and in my yard. Um, and in my front garden patch, I have this Japanese maple. And, they, and it can be, it's expensive to grow, to grow plants and buy plants. And when my son was born, my ex-mother-in-law bought us this beautiful Japanese maple. It's, a, it's not anything that's going to grow into a large tree. It's more like a feathery bush, and it's beautiful. And it's the focal point of that garden. Behind it are climbing flowers and vines. I have ground cover. I have hostas that are usually burnt from the morning sun. I have all kinds of plants. And I have a heck of a time keeping the weeds out. It requires a little bit of attention at the most every other day. If I let it go several days, which I have a lot recently because of heat and busyness, the weeds seem to sprout up everywhere. The honeysuckle vines, although they smell weak, smells so good, tend to creep in and choke my Japanese maple. It gets to be a mess. And the same is true of our souls. This is why some spiritual writers insist on a practice of contemplative prayer or centering prayer, because it's a way we can quiet our hearts and open them to the Spirit. In order for the divine life that is within to flourish, it needs some space to set down roots to grow, and that falls on us. 
There are many spiritual disciplines you can do to make time for God, but it also makes way for God's word to take root in us and in our faith lives. We must make space and invite God to speak and work in our lives. If we're only focused on getting more stuff or making a name for ourselves, or if we're constantly worried or anxious, then there's no space in our lives for the life of Christ to live and to thrive. We can't make the seed grow, but we can clear away some of the stuff that prevents that seed from growing. The Lord wants us to hear, to understand, and to put into practice his counsel and his instruction. He doesn't see us as vaults in which we should hide scripture, but rather as gardens in which his word can sprout and grow and bloom in glory to him. Therefore, it is essential that we cultivate God's word in our lives. Friends, this includes sincere devotion to God, the study of scripture, regular prayer, and a commitment to worship him each week in this house. That's how we can grow as disciples. And as we ourselves are growing individually, how do we as Christians use this parable, the parable of the sower, to imagine a fruitful ministry for the broader church? We know that the day he told the disciples that parable, later in the day, um, the disciples were kind of giving Jesus a bit of a hard time. They said, why do you tell stories? They asked this of Jesus, and he replied, You've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Not everybody has this gift, this insight, because it hasn't been given to them. Whenever someone has a ready heart for this, the insights and understandings flow freely. But if there's no readiness, no trace of receptivity soon disappears. And that's why I tell stories. To create readiness, to nudge people towards a welcome awakening. In their present state, they can stare till doomsday. They can listen till they're blue in the face, but they're not going to get it. Jesus goes on to say, your ears are open, but you don't hear a thing. Your eyes are awake, but you don't see a thing. People can be so dumb. They stick their fingers in their ears so they won't have to listen. They screw their eyes shut so they won't have to look. And so they won't have to deal with me face to face. And let them heal me. Let them heal, let me heal them. He goes on to tell them, you have God-blessed eyes, eyes that see. You have God-blessed ears, ears that hear. And a lot of people, prophets, humble believers, all of them among us, would have given anything to see what you're seeing and to hear what you're hearing. But they never had the chance we just never know, do we, the soil that we're working with, the people we're sharing the good news with? But this is encouraging. Some seed land in good soil. We've heard that. And even when the soil may not be so good, some seed may stay put long enough to eventually do some good. And this is real encouragement for those in the business I'm in. We don't know what might get through, and so we keep sharing the message. We keep teaching and preaching and writing and sharing because we never know. But this should also encourage you because you're also sowing seed. We all are. One of the primary ways God speaks to people is through people. We are the body of Christ. We are all called to scatter God's love and grace. And we're not to discriminate. It is not for us to say who is good soil or bad soil. It's not for us to say who is deserving and undeserving. Because there is a sense in which none of us are deserving. And there is a sense in, a sense in which we are all deserving. We are all God's children. We all bear the image of God no matter how marred that image may be. The spirit resides in all of us. John mentioned that this morning. It resides in us whether we know it or not. Who knows when a closed heart will become an open heart? Our job is not to judge. Our job is to scatter the seed. Friends, whenever you offer hospitality and welcome, you're scattering seed. Whenever you stand with and for the most vulnerable, you are sowing seed. 
whenever you do some work of mercy or share some word of kindness, or whenever you give of your resources and time to others, you are scattering and sowing the word of God. God is revealing God's self through you. God is speaking through you. And we are all sowers of seed. Beloved, God is calling and investing in you, in us, and in our church. Where can the seed of the word be thrown in our community? Where can those seeds of faith and of love be sown? What impact can we have in our neighborhood, our community, on the children and youth in our midst? And on the elderly, if we visited them? What seeds are already being planted, and how can we as Christians in this community help them to grow? And how do we see beyond the dirt and know that no seed is wasted when it comes to kingdom work and sharing God's word? Let us, as disciples, see a harvest when others see only dirt. So as we go from this place today, there's two I can't even count or show the right finger. There's two critical questions we face today. The first one, we know that we're all sowing seed. What kind of seed am I sowing? And second, what kind of soil represents my heart and my mind most of the time? Is my mind and heart closed? Is it distracted or preoccupied? Or am I open and receptive and ready for what God wants to show me and teach me. Friends, won't you please join me in a posture of prayer. Gracious God, may our hearts be open to receive your word to us. Help us to make space for your word to take root and to grow. And help us to realize, too, that just as you speak to us through others, you speak to others through us. Empower us to sow seeds of peace and of hope and of love every single day. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.